Hi, thanks for joining us. We're just waiting for um, a few more minutes uh, to get started tonight. Um, I'm here with Sarah Lohman, and we'll get started just about seven. Let people find that link. Thanks. Might have started it just a little too early tonight. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. We'll get started in just another couple minutes. Hi, Vishnu. Nice to see you. All right, I guess I'll get started with just a couple of announcements just to uh, not take up any more of Sarah's time here. But um, I guess in the chat, if you want to tell us where you heard about this program, just so that we know that information, and then, you know, we'll continue the conversation. Um, but you can use the chat during the program to um, communicate any questions that you have for Sarah. Uh, we will ask those at the end of the program. And you can also use the Q&A module um, that is part of the Zoom window as well. I think it's, is it there? Oh, just, I think you can just use the chat. The Q&A doesn't seem to be active at the moment. All right. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to let everyone know that the pop-up library is on the road. We have a few new stops. We're going to Chelmsford Village and also um, uh, the villages at Meadow, Wood, which is in North Chelmsford, in addition to the parks and playgrounds and the McKay Library. Tomorrow night, I just want to make sure everyone knows that, um, and I will share all of these events in a follow-up email tomorrow, along with the recording of tonight's program. Uh, tomorrow, we have a special concert at the McKay Library um, featuring uh, Mark Berger, Berger and Ride. Uh, they are coming to us from New York um, for a very special concert at the McKay Library. <clears throat> starting at 6 30 p.m and then on thursday august 25th at seven o'clock we have um extraterrestrial the first sign of intelligent life beyond earth with harvard's avi Loeb. um it should be really interesting a watch it wednesday's film screening dis and discussion is featuring monsoon wedding and that's going to be uh wednesday august 31st um at 6 30 p.m and finally, the making, we have a, a new series of um, programs on music um, with Beatles scholar Vinnie Bruno, and he's going to talk about the making of Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. Those last three that I mentioned are all virtual, just like the one tonight, um, so you can register in our calendar to receive the links to join. Um, but it's now seven o'clock, so I'm going to go ahead and get started.
Tonight, we welcome back Sarah Lohman. Um, Sarah is going to be online with us all throughout the fall. Um, so that's really exciting, um, presenting all new programs, for new programs to us anyway. Um, Sarah Lohman is the author of Eight Flavors, The Untold Story of American Cuisine, released in 2016 with Simon & Schuster. Eight Flavors is a number one bestseller on Amazon. The Atlantic called the book richly researched, intriguing, and cleverly written. You can buy that wherever books are sold, and there are copies available through the library. Um, formerly the curator of food programming at the Lower East Side Tenement Museum, she has lectured at hundreds of universities and institutions nationwide, including the Museum of Science Boston, the American Museum of Natural History, and the New York Public Library. Uh, tonight, she's going to talk about, she's going to give us the story of Ranji Smile, America's first celebrity chef, um, as well as the history of Indian cuisine in America. Um, Ranji Smile, long before New York City had Danny Meyer, the charismatic chef Ra J. Ranji Smile took the city by storm. Arising, arriving in New York City in 1899, Smile introduced Indian cuisine to the well-to-do, ushering curry into America's foodie lexicon. Uh, in this talk, we'll explore the history of Indian cuisine in America, as well as the lasting legacy of SMILE. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Sarah. Thank you so much for joining us. And again, please use the chat to um, ask any questions. Thanks. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Jess. It's just such a pleasure to be back with you all. And I'm so excited that I'll continue to be back uh, in the fall. And actually, um, Ooh, I think it's next month, but one of the talks we're doing this fall will be a chapter for my upcoming book uh, that should be out next summer, 2023. But tonight we're going to talk about a chapter in um, my book that came out in 2016. So this is my book. If you've gone on to these talks before, you've heard me talk about it. In Eight Flavors, The Untold Story of American Cuisine, I picked eight different ingredients that are prevalent in American cooking and told the stories behind them. So let me give you a little background about what we're going to talk about tonight. When I was working on this book and you had to go to a party or maybe I was talking to the press and people, of course, the question they're going to ask is, all right, well, what are the flavors? So they're in chronological order in my book as to when they kind of came into the American lexicon. So I would start with, okay, well, there's black pepper, there's vanilla, there's chili powder, there's curry powder. And that's the moment when people say, wait, 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 wait. Curry powder isn't American. That's Indian. And this is one of the reasons that I wanted to write about this flavor, because the earliest recipes for curry powder in America date back to the 17th century. So um, America has been cooking various forms of curry for a couple hundred years. So why do we talk about this food as though it hasn't been a part of our cuisine for basically for since before America existed, we have been cooking food influenced by the spices and styles of India. Now, those early uh, foods and flavors came because of trade routes, that we were establishing trade routes with India and the Far East, with Indonesia too, that were bringing these spices in, but all the early American cookbooks had instructions on how to make your own curry powder from scratch, which more closely resembles what um, spice blends are actually like in India. Curry powder is the sort of like hand exported version of different spice blends from all over India that also vary by cook too. So that uh, in England, soldiers and merchants that were stationed in India when it was uh, colonized, when it was a colony, uh, could take a bit of that taste of the food they liked at home. And the word curry is a, a pseudo English word that evolved as a catch all for all of the for all of Indian cuisine in one way, even though it varies greatly from province to province. But it was also sort of the name that local Indian cooks developed for this like basic dish that they would serve an English clientele, which was usually like meat covered in a spicy sauce served over rice that all became curry. So in the Western world, we still use this as sort of a catch-all phrase, especially for the many dishes that evolved that are Indian hyphenated cuisine, whether it's Anglo-Indian cuisine or Indian American cuisine. Um, so a brief back history. So we get people who are trading with India, sailors who have been there. So we start to see curry dishes first popping up in port towns long before we ever see immigrants from places like Southeast Asia. 
Now, all that being said, um, as I was doing research on curry in general, the history of this sort of Anglo hyphenated cuisine in India, and then how it moved across the globe all the way to Japan, by the way, if you want more details on that, it's all in the chapter. Uh, I came across this, uh, this name, Chef Ranji Smiles, Chef Joe Smile, Prince Ranji Smile. And I thought, okay, that's interesting. Uh, he's a chef that's working in America at the turn of the 20th century. I mean, there's got to be a great book out about him somewhere. I'm just going to read that bio. I'm going to write him into my chapter. More people are going to know about him. He sounds like an amazing, interesting person. And as it turned out, when I started looking into it in 2014, 2015, there was no large piece of writing done about Ranji Smile. There was no book. There were a few very short articles. And like I said, his name is mentioned in some of the best books that are out there about the history of curry, um, but very little was known about him. So out of all the chapters that I write about, yes, I write about the ingredients, but more importantly, I wrote about the people who, who made these flavors popular in America. Um, it's a little sort of biography of sorts of these different people who are often immigrants that change American cuisine forever. And so out of all the chapters, this chapter on Ranji's smile is the one where I had to do the most primary source research. So much so, in fact, that I, I teach a, a, a workshop on how to research, and I use him as my example of the many methods and different documents and sources that you can pull together to sort of try to recreate the life of someone in the past. And I have to say that he is by far the most fascinating person I've ever had the pleasure to research. Um, even this talk is not going to do him justice. So I want to encourage you to read the curry chapter in the book to get more details on his story. Um, Jess is also going to put a link in the chat right now to a Vox article that came out uh, last year, I think. Oh, actually, it was just it's going to be in the next Best American Food Writing Anthology. Um, Oh, Vishnu, I'm glad that you have some facts already. That's so exciting. Yes. Okay. So um, the Vox article has more information. I was interviewed for that as well as of Vivek Bald, who is a uh, Southeast Asian American scholar who's working on a full biography of Smile, which I'm really, really excited um, because since he was one of many chapters in my book, I couldn't go as far down the rabbit hole as I wanted to, but I also sort of realized that this wasn't my story to tell. So I cannot wait to, to read Bald's book. He is a scholar at MIT. So yeah, okay, that's where you heard about him. So the most, so Vishnu was just saying that he heard that he came from London and that he was denied his, uh, that Smile was denied his U.S. citizenship. Absolutely, we're going to get into all of that. Um, and one of the most exciting things for me about having written about him in my book is that there has started to be this greater awareness of this person that 120 years ago was big news. I call him the first celebrity chef because certainly before Smile existed, there were chefs who were well known. Um, uh, and now I can't think of any of their names. The chef of the Monaco's of the 19th century was extremely well known. There was also a French chef at the turn of the 19th century that was, I wouldn't say a household name, but perhaps a household name amongst the rich. But the way that Smile is treated in the press at the, at the turn of the 20th century is like any celebrity gossip column, like infatuation that you would read in articles today. And he also had this really bombastic sense of, and this performativeness, as well as the fact that he was a very talented chef. So let's get into it. Let's learn a little bit more about the man, the myth, the legend. Was Ranji Smell even a real person? <laughs> I love that question. He was definitely a real person and I've got the documentation to prove it, I will show you. Um, it, it's, I know the story is rather fantastical because he was one of the most famous people in America at the turn of the 20th century as a Muslim immigrant from what was then India. And he was famous for cooking Indian food. It's so, it's the total antithesis of the story we tell, uh, 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 is the story that is told about America in that time. But like, the era before, even, all right, we think of the Roaring Twenties, there were also the naughty oddies. Like there, it was a really wild and really open time too, where people of different backgrounds, ethnicities, even genders of sexuality were not only accepted on a certain level, but becoming openly famous. But of course, that's a little complicated. Ranji Smile was a real person. Ranji Smile was not his real name. Unfortunately, we don't know what that was. So here is what we do now. So Smile's story begins uh, in Karachi. Karachi today is the capital city of modern day Pakistan, but at the time it was part of India. 
And actually, we just passed the anniversary of partition. You may have seen some news articles coming up, some things coming up on social media too. And partition is the event that happened after Indian independence, where Britain decided that it was going to create basically three different countries uh, one that was going to be primarily Hindu states, and then two, or it was eventually split into two that were going to be primarily Muslim. So that is a whole story that any anyone who wants to understand world history should read an article about that to understand the effect that it had on the Indian people. But at this time, yes, he was living in a largely but not exclusively Muslim city. We don't even know Smile was born in Karachi. He might have been born from the area around there and then moved in the city as a young person to find work. And it seems like he was probably working for the British, the colonial government, um, making money that way, perhaps even as a chef early on. We know 1879 based on some later documents, you know, Karachi based on some later documents. Um, we have his mother and father's name, uh, his, his uh, mother's last name is Kitija, um, and his father's last name is Asida Smile, but again, we suspect that this is, we mean me and the few other scholars that study this, suspect that it's a nickname, um, that he, uh, he was either an anglicized version of his name, or there was a soccer star around this time, a football star named Smile, that he might have just like, people thought he looked like him, but we don't know his original name, we don't know really who his family is. We don't know where he is born because this information is even coming from documents that he is, you know, writing down himself in America. Um, so in less than 20 years, we do find Smile in London and he is working between two hotels, the Cecil and the Savoy. And the Cecil and the Savoy were known as being some of the biggest poshest hotels in London. And the Cecil in particular um, accommodated for American guests. Uh, the advertisement for the Cecil in the 1890s mentioned things like the American style cocktail bar, which Americans were known for their cocktails and certainly loved a cocktail, but also advertised things like American chairs, which I have no idea what that would be. But both of these hotels boasted a kitchen that served uh, curries, that served Indian Anglo-Indian cuisine. And this is because again, Britain had occupied India at this point for a few hundred years. And so um, that's the reason that like um, chicken tandoor is one of Britain's national dishes. Like you could start getting, uh, curry started appearing in coffee houses in London and like again, the 17th century. And there was this habit of uh, military men or merchants who were stationed in India to either bring their chef back with them or once they came back to Britain, hire a chef that had trained in India because people had developed a taste for the food. So at a lot of places like hotels and clubs, there would often be an Indian chef uh, employed there working in sort of an Indian kitchen and cooking these Anglo-Indian specialties. And we know he's here because there is a, um, he was a colonel who later became a food writer and he would like write about this guy that he called Smiler in the kitchens of the Cecil and how like great his food was and even made this note that Smiler has gone to New York to seek fame and fortune. So what we know happened, oh, by the way, this is the kitchen of the, the Cecil. So you can see it is a cavernous massive space and you can imagine it when it's full of chefs buzzing around and cooking in here. Smile would have been in there somewhere as a very young man, not even 20 um, cooking in this kitchen and gaining acclaim for his food already to be mentioned basically as a teenager in this uh, sort of food history of London. So he came to New York because of this man named Lewis Sherry. Now, anyone who's familiar with the history of New York has probably heard of the restaurant Delmonico's, which was founded back in the 1830s and in some capacity still exists, but certainly was probably America's most famous restaurant in the 19th century and arguably its first restaurant as well. Lewis Sherry had the restaurant Caddy Corner till Delmonico's, horizontal across the street. And it was just as grand as Delmonico's, but Sherry was a bit of a showman. He got his start sort of catering elaborate parties and became very famous when he catered a party that was for the uh, opening of the Mikado. And all of the food was Japanese themed and the decorations were Japanese themed and the actors came in. It was a really big deal that made him really famous. So he had this sort of flair. So in 1899, Sherry was in London on business and he was staying at the American Hotel, the Cecil. And he must have tried some of Smile's curries because he propositioned Ranji Smile to come back to New York and develop an Indian kitchen within his restaurant, Sherry's. 
Here's Sherry's in 1899. Again, this is going to be it's like Madison Avenue and 40 something Street in Manhattan. So at the time, an extremely wealthy neighborhood and one like fairly far north in terms of what is built up and populated. And you can see that this is really, really, really an extravagant building here. I actually don't know what was on the up, up the upper floors, if they were like private dining rooms or if these were people's homes. But you can see the entrance to Sherry's under the um, awnings there on the bottom floor. Um, so this is a big extravagant place. It's Delmonico's number one competition. I wouldn't say that you're either like a Sherry's or Delmonico's person. I think you just kind of went there for other things. But like many fine dining restaurants at the turn of the 20th century, Sherry's was predominantly a French restaurant. So it was actually quite unusual to um, have anything else, <laughs> to eat any other kind of food. Um, let's take a look inside. Here's what Sherry's dining room looks like. You know, you can tell that this is absolutely opulent. So an invitation from Louis Sherry to come cook in this restaurant really, really, really meant something. And I say that he was famous for these, but like bombastic um, parties. Like this is one of the private dinners that was hosted there. And I don't think I could find a slide for this one. Um, the photos just weren't high quality, but one of his most famous uh, dinner parties was served and eaten entirely while, while the guests sat on the backs of horses. For no apparent reason, he just liked like a crazy, crazy dinner party. You can see elaborate, extravagant, everything's silver. It's all, everyone's in their finest wear. So it's actually from a sort of review, like a restaurant review of what's going on at Sherry's that we get the first image of Ranji's smile at about 20 years old. It's always interesting to see images of him, um, kind of both how he's interpreted, but also how he is presenting himself. Um, that at least in this version, he is wearing something between like a Western and Indian clothes, but his head is wrapped. He is described as having a very short cut beard, having really, really white teeth, having a beautiful collect, uh, complexion, and in general, in general, honestly, being kind of sexy. That word isn't used explicitly, but um, the title of this article uh, that is also this restaurant review is A Chef from India, Women Go Wild for Him. So even from the beginning, like he's kind of um, an, an infatuating to the female diners that both come into the restaurant, but already is big enough news that this was like in the New York Daily Post, I believe. Um, that he is being published and that there's a depiction of him in one of the biggest newspapers in New York City. Um, and then also in this, oh, I, I didn't realize I didn't have that. So there's also a menu too of his basic dishes. And it describes um, that there is, so there's, there's the regular French menu and then there's an Indian menu that you can order off of. And you can either have basically a tasting menu, so like a, a set dishes, or you can order um, uh, a la place, you can order a la carte. You can order a la carte one item at a time. And it's like such a part of, um, Smile himself is such a part of the appeal and the advertising of coming there that he will actually come out personally and serve the dishes to you and tell uh, you about them too, which is probably why he gets some of the reputation of being kind of a hottie because he's not just hiding back there in the kitchen. He's actually coming out and he's got this big personality and he's really charming. He talks about that he grinds all the spices himself. He talks about in a later article that he says that people are very afraid of Indian cuisines. So they think it's going to be very hot and spicy, but he says, you know, not all that the spice has to be in balance. And that one day he would love to write a cookbook to teach American women how to cook beautiful Indian food. He also says that eating Indian food will make you more beautiful too. So he really is quite the charmer. So a few years later in 1901, it seems that um, Smile's menu and his presence in Sherry's is a big enough a success that Sherry's actually sends him back to India um, or maybe to London, but basically to recruit more workers um, so that they can perhaps expand the menu. There was some talk of opening an Indian restaurant to the scholar I mentioned, um, Vivek Bald has written more about the sort of restaurant scandal, which seems to have not gone well. The restaurant was going to be named the Omar Khayyam, and it may have opened for a little bit, and it may have not, but it all comes back to the fact that Smile went abroad to go find workers. And this led to the what is known as the Prince Scandal of 1901, which is in some ways kind of hilarious. 
So a little bit uh, about immigration history in America. This is not the funny part. Um, so starting in 1882, America passed its first race-based um, immigration act. And that was the 1882 Chinese exclusion law that literally, literally banned the immigration of people from China simply because they were from China with just a few exceptions. Um, that law was expanded by 1911. It uh, was by measures of latitude and it basically said that no immigrants can come from all of Southeast Asia. So by 1901, we're, we're sort of between those two places, but there was a law that said that you could not um, promise an immigrant a job before they arrived. So when people were being processed at Ellis Island, one of the questions they would often be asked is, do you have employment here? And whether or not you know, your cousin had said, yeah, come on, I got a job for you, or an employer had paid because you were a skilled employee to come immigrate, you had to say no. And ostensibly, this is, that was to prevent um, slavery. It was an anti-slavery law and an anti-trafficking law. Um, but it was also mostly because we were so afraid of immigrants coming to this country and using up social services that the ability to pay your own ship's passage was seen as a sort of um, milestone of your ability to succeed within America, okay? So when Smile went abroad, whether it was all the way to India, modern day Pakistan, or whether it was just to London, um, to recruit worker, workers and probably doing this at Sherry's bequest with money to pay for their passage, he was doing something that was illegal under immigration law at that time. Um, what is funny about it is he knew and Sherry knew this was illegal. So he concocted this new identity, which was Prince Ranji Smile. So when his ship arrived in London, he actually stayed at the Cecil Hotel, the old place where he used to work. But this time he arrived as a foreign dignitary with an entourage. And he was dressed to the nines. He's wearing silk, he's wearing gold. Um, and all of the people that he you know, wanted to work in his restaurant or wanted to work at Sherry's, this was his traveling entourage. So under this pretense, this is what would allow him to get into America. But the article that was written about it um, in one of the British papers, he was eventually recognized there. And it was laughing about how, you know, he used to have to bow to the customers there at the Cecil. And now there were all these rich British men bowing to him, this foreign prince, which is pretty awesome. So he actually takes his crew, I think it's about 40 people and they go to Canada and they, they don't go through, um, uh, like Ellis Island. They don't go through like an, an East Coast immigration station. Um, they go through an, an entry point in upstate New York. They basically take the train into the city. And he gets in and the entourage gets in and it's not basically until he arrives in New York at Penn Station that someone is like, wait a minute, that is not uh, a prince. That is the chef at Sherry's restaurant. He was already too famous and was getting recognized. So he was at first met by someone from Sherry's and then Sherry's like totally abandoned him and was like, you are on your own. We've been found out. Um, and he kind of backtracks a little bit and he says, oh, no, Prince is just my first name. And yeah, I look rich because my father died and he was a merchant and I inherited a bunch of money. And again, this is why it's difficult for us to know exactly what his past really is, because for a variety of reasons, he wasn't necessarily truthful about who he was. Um, all the people he brings with him eventually get deported within about four years. Uh, Smile could have faced a fine of up to $5,000 per person. Um, but I think that the complexity with Sherry's being involved, I don't know what happened, but he seems to have been okay. But unfortunately, everyone he brought with him um, to hopefully become restaurant workers were all sent back home. Kind of a wild time. So basically, right after this happens, Smile applies for his American citizenship. And so I'm curious, too, to see if maybe he did this to protect himself, although he did come over here uh, under the law. I should also emphasize that other than the immigration laws that I mentioned, 
Um, one that says no Chinese people, one that says you can't have your fare paid for and your, your uh, a job promised to you. Eventually there were some literacy laws kind of, but other than that, there are no immigration laws. So there's really no such thing as an undocumented immigrant at this time, unless you were Chinese, very specifically. So other than that, our, our doors in America were pretty much wide open for anyone to come in. So Smile had come in under the law and therefore he was not deported. However, anyone could come into this country, but not everyone could become a citizen. Because at that time, uh, when the American Constitution was written in 1776-ish, um, it said that only white men could become citizens. And then after the Civil War that was amended to white and black men could become citizens. Notice too that in that phrasing, men is actually not used to encompass women in that way. Um, up until women's suffrage, women who were born in this country were considered American citizens, but women who had immigrated could not apply for citizenship themselves. They had to uh, get citizenship either through their father's immigration status or through their husband's immigration status. And that actually even meant that as an American citizen, if I married someone who was an immigrant, I could actually lose my American citizenship. So women had very, very few rights. And of course, when we're talking about Smile, a man from India, he is neither white nor black. And so right around the turn of the century, as we're seeing more immigrants come from Asia and Southeast Asia, um, there are court cases going to the Supreme Court, sort of battling what it means to be white or black and who can be a citizen. But as far as Smile citizenship, there is documentation to prove that he applied in 1904. Fascinatingly, it also gives his address too. I've never done like a walking tour to see all the sites of him in New York. I would really like to do that sometime. Um, but the um, documentation attached to it basically says that uh, this person filed an application to become naturalized. Um, there are about 9,000 records like that where either they were abandoned or denied. And so I suspect that he was actually denied citizenship because of the color of his skin, because he was brown, because of his heritage, because he was an Indian person. And there was simply no, there wasn't a law in America that said he was allowed to become a citizen. And so what would happen throughout the country is uh, when men who were neither black or white applied for citizenship, it was up to the individual judge to decide if they were white or black and could become a citizen of this country. So this is why his story is so fascinating to me too, because it touches on so many different things um, that are going on in our country at this time. So I don't know if Smile applied to make sure that he was safe and could stay in this country only, but certainly he applied because he wanted to stay here. And as he later stated that he really loved this country and loved the Americans, but was denied the right to become a full and equal citizen of this country. So he couldn't vote, couldn't participate really in any way in politics, didn't have the safety of knowing he would, could not be deported. So here's a photograph of him. After he loses his job at Sherry's, he actually starts touring in this really interesting way that I've not really seen any other culinary people at this time do. Sure, people move from different jobs, but Smile actually went and had residencies. He would cook in Atlantic City during the summertime. Um, this is from a photo of a residency at a hotel in Philadelphia. He cooked in Washington, D.C. He cooked in Boston, and he was covered in all the newspapers as he came through town. He was interviewed, and actually articles about him, sort of AP style, were reprinted all across America. I found um, reprints of articles about him as far west as Utah. He never set foot in Utah, that's for sure, but Americans broadly were absolutely fascinated with him. And part of it too is when he would tour, he would bring his retinue of servants as they called them, and they were fire eaters and snake charmers and exotic dancers. And then he was cooking. There, there was usually again like a formal evening dinner. In this case, I think I do. Yes, good. I do have the menu from this. Um, so you can see that every night you can go to this particular hotel and you can get specialties um, like the Indian dinner is on Thursdays. It's $1.50 per person. So that's like your tasting menu. Um, a lot of things, his cuisine is interesting. And I talk about this more in the book because some of the dishes he will serve are extremely authentic to the region he comes from. 
Some are dishes that are like um, like Anglo, like things that he sort of invented to cater to the tastes of Americans or the English. And some are things that he may have totally invented himself. Like down here under the Indian dinner that we can get on Thursdays, you know that you see that there's one dish called Morgi Ranji. Um, Morgi means chicken and Ranji is him. So it's like chicken Ranji. What does that mean? Unfortunately, he never wrote that cookbook. So I don't really know. Um, above that though is musky sind, which is a hot pepper and uh, fish dish um, from his from Karachi, from his region in Pakistan that is so delicious and also so authentic. And then we have something like um, curry madras, which is probably just a basic madras curry. Uh, in terms of American cooking at that time, that meant that it was usually done with chicken, usually served over rice, usually sort of a yellow sauce, but actually quite spicy. Um, the historical recipes that I've seen in other cookbooks will have turmeric, will have ginger, but will also have like cayenne pepper pods in it too. Um, so for the time, like, you know, there's this, his, his, around this time, Americans weren't eating a lot of spice in their food, except you could like go to one of these special dinners and get like dinner in a show and all of it was spicy. And then there was this really like hunky Indian man serving this food to you. So, oh, and you can see the ladies' tea is served by Prince Raji and retinue servants from 4 to 6 p.m., 25 cents a person. So, like, he's selling himself, he's selling sexuality, but he is also selling this idea of Orientalism. So Orientalism is a term that's largely imply, um, applied to art and interior design uh, around the turn of the 20th century. And what the Orient referred to in the 20th century was basically anywhere from Northern Africa to Japan. It was all the Orient. And it was all sort of presented as this mishmash of usually, again, visual styles. This idea, like the Orient just kind of referred to over there, far away, we don't know a lot about it. So we're gonna like make this fantasy about it too. And so this was really popular in the early 20th century, this style of art and interior design. And so Smile, in a way, embodied the in-person form of that. He became the Orientalism celebrity. He sold this exotic seductiveness that came along with him, and he did it really, really successfully, too. Um, and I should say, too, that another one of the reasons that he really grabbed the attention of the press and the public is that basically every time he moved to a new city, he had a new lady on his arm. Um, he seems to have been married back in London, at least he that's what he said, but this wife passes away. I think I documented at least five different relationships, like he had four official marriages and at least one unofficial marriage. And I'm sure there were more like he was a player, seriously. And he was marrying, um, they were often the daughters of immigrants. So they were white women, like Violet Roschlitz. Her parents were Eastern European Jewish immigrants and she was born in Brooklyn, but they weren't people who were fully considered white Americans, if that makes sense. They were somewhere in between. Still, most of the country had laws for baying the marriage of people with different colored skin. And again, because this was such a subjective law, when people who were from two different backgrounds wanted to get married, they would often just try different judges until they found someone who thought that their skin tones were close enough that they could get married. Again, this touches on some really ugly and often forgotten things, but that law wasn't overturned until Loving v. Virginia, which was what, the 60s, the 40s? I can't even remember now, but later in the 20th century, I'm sure somebody knows or just will look up when uh, Loving v. Virginia came out, but basically it was the marriage between a white man and a black woman, and it went all the way to Supreme Court. So his, it seems like his most stable relationship was, was, was with Violet Rochlitz. They get married in 1912. She is just as bombastic as he is. They, this is a photo of her. You could see her in a big hat with the flower on it. And she is a burgeoning uh, Broadway star. And actually she does get cast in a show. Thank you so much. And what was, what was the year? Should I click through? 40s or 60s, 40s or 60s. I want to say 1967. 67? That's insane. Yeah. Now, of course, not every state in America 
had these laws like Massachusetts and New York City, you know, two places where Violet and Smile were actively together and working, um, did not have these laws. Um, but a lot of other places did. So it's interesting that the articles don't really comment on it. They'll comment about like, he's handsome, she's beautiful. But what did people think of this Indian man marrying white women? Um, I'm showing you this uh, dancing around a piece of sheet, sheet music. Um, this is an Al Jolson musical that was on Broadway in 1914 and Violet Rochlitz was actually cast in this as one of the chorus girls. So she had a good start, but then unfortunately in 1914, she passes away from, I believe, congenital heart failure. It's a little um, not totally known from her death certificate. Do I have it on here? No. Um, and then it gets, it's a little more confusing too, because she is listed as single and her next of kin is her father. So they were definitely married. I have their marriage documents. It's on ancestry.com, but clearly her family um, didn't approve of it and tried to sort of erase her marriage from her record when she died. She died very young. She was in her early twenties. Basically at the same time, smile, I have to fill out a draft card. So even though he was not allowed to be a citizen and he couldn't vote, he was still required to go fight in World War I. And this, and this is such a repository of information. So in, that's the only reason I'm glad they had to do this, but it tells us so much about what his life is. So we have Ranji's smile. It has his current address, his age, his birthday. It lists his race as Oriental. Again, this whole Northern Africa to Japan. That's all of what that meant. Um, his citizenship is left empty. Um, it says he was born in India. It says he's a caterer, which could mean that he is a restaurant chef or could literally mean that he was doing catering jobs. It's hard to tell at this time. Um, or, uh, I think I decided this was Hermes, but it was a hotel. There's the list. Here's a new, they're not married. May Smell and Ranji Smell aren't married yet, but they, that document will come through. Um, and then we have his signature. This is the only piece of handwriting we have of him. It's extraordinary even to have these images of him, but we do have his name written down. Um, and talking with Vivek Vol, the sort of major scholar of Smile, honestly, one of there's a couple things that point to the fact that Smile didn't have a formal education and may not have been able to read and write. And one of them is this, you know, if he's working in a kitchen, normally you'd be regularly using uh, a pen and paper to document things and write things down. But it looks to me like, you know, he's barely ever held a pen in his life. So it seems likely that he, he could not write and that would make sense if he was born poor and didn't have access to an, an education. It's also based on the fact that when I see the same dish listed either on a different menu or a different newspaper article, it's always spelled a little differently. So that seems to indicate that Smile is, um, you know, saying the names of the dishes to one of his underlings or to the reporter, and it's getting copied down in different ways because, you know, he's not spelling it any one way. And then also we've never, you know, found that cookbook he wanted to write. I wish he had, I wish someone had worked with him on it. Um, who knows, maybe it's out there in some attic or something, but it seems, there seems to be an, it, it, an indication that he could not read or write. As far as I know, he did not have to go fight. Here he is on the 1920 census. He's got a new wife. They're not officially married. They are living together. This is Rebecca Smile. Um, and at this point, 1920, he's living in Harlem. Now, another book I'd highly recommend, and maybe it's in your library, is called Bengali Harlem. And that's the first book by the scholar Vivek Bald. And he looks at um, basically Indian and Bangladeshi immigration uh, into New York City and how these communities went up to Harlem where they could kind of integrate slash disappear. You know, the, the people weren't necessarily looking for them. A lot of them were uh, people who had jumped ship after serving on British vessels. Thank you, Jess. Um, and so they were sort of hiding out in some ways but then intermarried into the communities too. So there is a traditional sort of Muslim Bangladeshi population in Harlem in Manhattan. And although Smile himself is not Bangladeshi, he's from what is today Pakistan, um, he, he was Muslim. So even though there were people, his neighbors would have been from across the continent, he did share uh, faith with them. So that must have been comforting. And although we think of Harlem as a Black neighborhood, looking at this census is absolutely fascinating. 
um, because one of, so he is, uh, in this he's listed as black too, which also is interesting talking about how one is self-defining in different places or the assumptions that someone might be making about you as is his wife. But there's also a Japanese and black American family listed on the same census too. Like his, um, it was a really mixed and fascinating uh, neighborhood that he was living in at this point and still working as a restaurant uh, chef downtown. Image of him in 1922, and this comes from a trade journal, a restaurant trade journal, where it is talking about the best chefs in New York City. And here he is, a photo of him now at uh, 40, basically, still looking cute. And all the other chefs on this page are all white chefs that specialize in French cuisine. And so he is the only hotel chef, again, at a fancy hotel. And I don't know what kind of cuisine he's, uh, is from everything that I've seen, he stuck to his version of Indian food, whether it was from his hometown or his dishes of his own invention. Um, but at the same time, working in fancy hotels, he could have, I'm sure, mastered French cuisine as well. He seemed extremely talented, might've been cooking that as well. But he seemed pretty consistently employed throughout this whole time and working at some of the best places in America. And in a hotel restaurant trade journal is named one of the best chefs in the country in 1922. So around this time, let's go back to something that's happening in a big way. I mentioned that there were a couple um, Supreme Court cases challenging identity and citizenship at this time. And one of those is a Bhagat Singh Tind in 1923. Um, Mr. Tind, he was a immigrant from the Punjab that's in the north of India. And around this time, the 19 teens and 20s, California, the West Coast is seeing more immigrants come from the Punjab um, into basically the area around San Francisco. And today there is still a, a community around Yuba City. Um, he's a Sikh man. You can see his, his head is wrapped. He, it's part of the faith not to cut your hair. So he would not have cut the hair in his head. He would not have cut his beard. He went to college at Berkeley. He fought in World War I. And after all of that, uh, he applies for his citizenship and his citizenship is denied by the local judge because of the color of his skin. Now, when he takes this case to the Supreme Court, he says that, um, you know, my heritage is from the north of India. And so when you say someone is, um, hold on, I'm gonna have to think of the word for a second. Um, not Aryan is not the, the word that I'm looking for. Oh, shoot, I'm sorry. Basically one of the claims to whiteness is a mountain range and I can't find the name of it right now. But basically he was saying that he is Aryan based on where he comes from. And so therefore, if you're just finding someone who is white as being Aryan, that's him. And Supreme Court ruling uh, ruled against him and basically the majority ruling said, yes, you're right as far as your heritage or your geography, but this is a, only a slight paraphrase. I know what a white person looks like and it's not you. Almost at the same time, a Japanese man sued on the same pretense that he was not given his uh, citizenship. He goes all the way to the Supreme Court and basically says, look, here's my skin, it's white. Why aren't I being allowed to be a citizen? And the ruling was the opposite. Yes, you look white, but you don't come from the right geographical regions. So this idea is now made official, whereas some Asian people uh, thank you. Oh, Donna, my brain. Caucasian. He was saying he was from the Caucasus, the Caucasus Mountains, and that he should be he should be considered Caucasian. And the judge said, "Sure, you're Caucasian, but you're not white." Oh my God, Donna, thank you, my brain. Um, and then it was the opposite for the Japanese man. They said, "Yes, you're white, but you're not Caucasian." So now this is on a federal level. We are denying people from Asia their citizenship. Um, and so this must have been very affecting for Smile, who, yes, had already had his citizenship denied, but several um, tens of thousands of people from all over the Asian continent had gotten their citizenships. Um, and then now those citizenships were overturned. They actually had their citizenships revoked based on these two Supreme Court rulings. And so it gives you a sense for people who, I mean, I can't imagine someone more American than this man who goes to, who, you know, immigrated here, was raised here around Yuba City, went to Berkeley, fought for our country, and yet he cannot be a citizen because he is an Indian man. 
So not that many years after this big Supreme Court ruling, um, Smiley leaves. We have basically his steamship records that say that he's headed to London. Um, and it's basically a document that would have been given uh, to immigration in London, where, you know, it's saying like he's from New York, he is going to the, the Cecil, but it's just where he's staying. And his ultimate destination is Karachi. And this is basically the last documentation we have of someone like setting eyes on him. I don't know what happened to him when he went to London. I don't know if he, he had a soft lie and was maybe going back to work at the Cecil, because certainly now uh, we're getting into prohibition too. And during the 1920s, a lot of major restaurants closed because they could no longer sell alcohol, which made more money than the food. And so uh, Prohibition in 1919 hit the restaurant industry very hard. In fact, even Sherry's closed in this era. And one of the things that Louis, Louis Sherry cited was Prohibition uh, and the fact that he couldn't sell alcohol anymore. So it could have been simply the fact that he couldn't get a job anymore at the age of 50 um, because of Prohibition. Maybe also he was tired of the kitchen work, which is dark and exhausting and demanding. Um, maybe though it was also the sense of even though he wanted to be long, he spent his entire adult life in this country, he was continuously denied that right to citizenship. So I don't know if he's going to go to the Cecil. I don't know if he was going all the way back to Karachi to retire. This is the last document we've been able to find, except for uh, May Smile, who when she wanted to get her basically a divorce, but she calls it an annulment here. Um, you had to put a public notice if you didn't know where the husband was saying that this was happening and to show up in court if you care. And obviously he didn't show up um, because he might not even been alive. This is now 1930. So this is the next year where if he was, he was in a completely different country. And of course, May Smile was his last wife, but also not the last woman that he was documented living with. Did he get sick and pass away? Did he retire in Karachi? Did he open another restaurant somewhere under a new name? This is as far as I've been able to get, but man, what a ride, what a fascinating person and what a look at this point in time where who could have imagined that a Muslim immigrant at this moment was even in America in 1899, but was also known coast to coast and was one of the most famous people in the country and America's first celebrity chef. Yeah, if you got questions, please send them in. Again, if you want to learn to more uh, and also hear sort of other opinions um, about Smile, that Vox article is really a great one. Smile has his own Wikipedia page now, which I'm very excited about. So like he's just, he's existing. I'm hoping that there's so much more scholarly work done about him and about what his sort of rise to fame mean meant for America and means for America in that time. Um, and then of course I write more details um, in my book, there is, you know, we don't have any of his writing, sadly, but he, since he's such like a press oriented person, um, we have a lot of quotes from him in the newspapers. So you get to hear a version of his story in his own words. Um, so there you go. Ranji smile. Fascinating. That was so cool. I, and just, I love that. I love that, that it relates to, you know, immigration, citizenship, and and what it means to be an American and 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 all of that. It's really amazing. And those um, race-based immigration laws that affected people coming from Asia and Southeast Asia, those actually weren't overturned until 1965. So there is a huge amount of change in the civil rights era, you know, 30, 40 years after Smile was experiencing the effects of that too. It's really shocking how um, these massive changes that basically amount to treating people who aren't white as human, um, happened within the living memory of my parents. And obviously, oh, yeah. we're still on a journey to make these changes too. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, yeah, that was great. That was really great. Um, does anyone have any questions tonight? No? Let's see. You can raise your hand too, and I can call on you and you can speak if you'd like to. Do you have any questions, Jess? No, I I don't. I think I think it was such a fascinating presentation. I had no idea that that, that he uh, existed and that Indian food was, as you mentioned, was that. Um, did he have children? Not, that, we, not that we know. Yeah, a lot of wives, 
clearly a lot of girlfriends, but as far as I've been able to tell, no children. But again, I'm really excited to see what Vivek uncovers. He's written, like I, I mentioned, I never been able to find like an easy access to it, an article about the Omar Khayyam restaurant that he opened um, and I think pretty rapidly closed too. Um, and the last time I talked to Vivek after I found out someone was working in a book, of course, my first question is, do you know what happened to him? And the answer is no. Um, it, we don't know if it can be known. And maybe that answer isn't here. Maybe it's all the way back in Karachi. We're really not sure. What was the name of that author that you were talking about that's going to publish a book? I am going to write it in the chat. Thank Vivek you. Bald, um, and um, he also wrote Bengali Harlem, too. So, oh, okay. Great. So, 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 so that's him. What's the, is the best source for his quotes? Really newspapers. Um, I quote him pretty heavily in my book. And then I also, of course, it's all endnoted too. So you can look at the original newspapers, but um, really he was always talking to the press. He was a press darling. He always had something to say. He was very sassy, very funny. So, um, so yeah, yeah, yeah. So you just like looking through newspaper articles about him, um, even he's, he was in the New York times too. That's where you can find some of the, the best sources for quotes of him. Oh, the namesake. Is that the book by Jhumpa Lahiri? Yeah. I don't remember that, but maybe it just didn't stick out for me when I was reading it. That's okay. Great. So you're confused. Oh, the movie. The Supreme court ruling on the citizen for Asians. I take the answer was no. Yes. The answer was no. Basically for a man who was Indian uh, from the Caucasus region, because we call white people Caucasian, um, the Supreme Court said, yes, you're Caucasian, but I'm looking at your skin color and you're not white. And for the Japanese man who had uh, inarguably a white skin tone, they said, yes, you look white, white, but you're from Japan, your heritage isn't right. So that basically said no to anyone who wasn't from Europe. That's anyone who didn't have a European heritage was not white and was not allowed to become an American citizen. And the result of those Supreme Court decisions is that for the past 20 or 30 years, Asian people in America, some had been able to get their citizenships. Because like I mentioned, you're not going to the Supreme Court to get your citizenship, you're going to a local judge. So if the local judge decides that you're usually the discussion is around being white, because honestly, being black was so difficult in this country, no one wanted to be categorized as black. You wanted your citizenship to say you were white because you wanted an easier time in this country in just to like not mince words about that. So if a local judge decided you were white, you got your citizenship. But then this federal ruling meant that either you had to go into hiding about your heritage, which I'm sure certain some people did, or if people knew that you were Japanese, Chinese, Indian, whatever it was, um, you would lose your citizenship. So you were actually, your citizenship was revoked after these, you, these Supreme Court decisions. Women's citizenship for a family allowed for non-whites or blacks? That's a great question. Um, I think that happened by the 1940s. It was before, so 1965 overturned race-based immigration laws. And I think that citizenship's re, uh, requirements were changed in the 1940s. But that's a great question that I don't know the total answer to. I will recommend one of my major sources for uh, learning about, but both for this chapter, and I wrote another chapter uh, about soy sauce and Chinese immigration too. There's a wonderful book called Angel Island, subtitle something, something, something. And it's uh, Angel Island is the West Coast immigration station that everyone knows about Ellis Island, but unless you're local to San Francisco, very few people know about Angel Island. And while, while Ellis Island was set up to basically welcome people into the United States, um, Angel Island was specifically set up to mostly deny people entry to the United States. And it's because of its location, because America at the turn of the 20th century was actively trying to keep out immigrants from Asia. So in this book, uh, it's not just about, it, it is a lot about the law. So it's sort of based around the story of Angel Island, but how the laws were changing and how like the Supreme Court decisions were affecting things. But she, each chapter is about a different national group. So there's a chapter about Indian immigration, chapter about Japan, chapter about Korea, chapter about China. And it goes through the whole history of these groups' immigrations into America, as well as the various laws, the racism they faced. It's a really, really great book if you'd like to learn more about the other half of immigration at the turn of the century. Again, we talk a lot about Ellis Island and Irish and German and Eastern European Jewish, but you know there was a whole other thing happening on the West Coast. 
oh my gosh, funny note for you, Sarah. My husband walked by at the start of your presentation. He doesn't participate, but I like them and said, oh, hey, it's that lady. <laughs> <laughs> Catherine is here every month, apparently. We'll tell your husband, you're going to be seeing a lot more of me because Jess, I'm so thrilled, is inviting me to come back basically every month this fall. We've got four presentations lined up. Is that true? Yes, we do. And I am just going to tell you when you're coming back in September. Um, that is going to be the hunt for endangered apples, um, which is such a, it's such a great time of year to talk about apples. And I'm really curious to find out more about endangered apples. And the date on that is September 22nd um, at 7 p.m., just like it was tonight. Um, and so you can register in our calendar. And uh, yeah, we're really looking forward to it. Another great presentation, Sarah. Thank you. My pleasure. Yeah, I'm going to turn you all into apple sluice next month. So get ready. Cool. All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a great evening. Thank you, Sarah. My pleasure. Good night. Good night.